with a burning airplane, the objective is get it on the ground now. All right, so welcome to another episode of Tom Air. A little different uh, style, a little different setting today. Uh, today we're at our good friend Paul Briggs' home. Paul has invited us into his home to share an experience that he had recently. Uh, a couple weeks ago now, Paul was involved in an aviation incident. I'm going to let Paul describe the, the incident in its totality. Um, but yeah, I'd like to thank, thank Paul for inviting us into his home and uh, and being open to having a little chat about this because one of the big things on the channel is uh, knowledge and experience and learning from mentors. Paul has been a mentor of mine. If you've been watching the channel, you've seen Paul right from the beginning. Obviously, we were together in episode one and two where we had the forced landing in the yeah. Lake Buccaneer. So that was a, an interesting experience. If you haven't seen that episode, it's, it's well worth a look. There's a lot of great aviation learning and experience was, was yeah. gleaned in that episode, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, there's been another incident. I wasn't involved in this one. Paul was. And um, yeah, let, maybe first off, uh, so Paul owns a number of aircraft. Um, this one involved a, a pretty special airplane. So maybe tell us about the airplane in question and then, and then we'll talk about what happened, Paul. Well, uh, thanks for having me back, Tom, and uh, you're welcome here to uh, our farm. Uh, I, I have been very fortunate uh, over the years to own many airplanes and uh, one of the airplanes that I came into ownership of or more correctly stewardship of was uh, a fighter escort wings TP-51 Mustang. Now this is a 66% scale fully composite uh, Mustang. It's uh, powered by a Corvette LS1 engine known as a ZZ3. Um, and um, it, of all of the scale replicas of Mustangs, of which there are a number, uh, the FEW is absolutely the best. It's considered to be uh, the most realistic and it handles exactly like a P-51 Mustang. Um, we were lucky enough to, I, was, I, I wasn't lucky enough to fly in this plane, obviously, because it's a single seater. Yes, it was. But you, you brought us in to do some filming of this aircraft a couple of years ago. Thankfully, we have that. During COVID. During COVID, we filmed the plane and I was, I was, it was quite remarkable how fast and how, what a high performance machine that was. And I know you weren't even flying it aerobatically at the time no. because it wasn't insured for aerobatics, but I was blown away by the speed when you did that, that low and over, how fast you were going. And it was awesome to see. And I'm so glad I got, got to see that plane. And it's amazing yes. in its full performance. Well, and, and the interesting thing is that um, uh, I actually had the engine built uh, to NASCAR race standards by a NASCAR engine builder. Um, who is the brother of uh, one of the fellows who does our engine work. And um, uh, it started like a charm, it ran like a charm, and it had lots of power. Um, the ZZ3 can make upwards of 450 to 500 horsepower, but um, I had it derated to about 378 horsepower on the dyno, uh, which was more than enough. Uh, there's, as you know, there's always a happy balance between making power and the rate of wear. Um, and when I spoke to other people who are much more expert in these fields than I, they all said, take the, the conservative approach, take a modest approach to your uh, power output. And I did. And in fact, I customarily ran this engine right toward the bottom of the power scale to get that reliability and that life out of the engine. So does that aircraft, did that aircraft perform at the same level as a, as a regular, as a P-51 Mustang, World, well, World the, War II P-51 Mustang? The P-51, Mustang? of course, uh, was, uh, was a much heavier airplane. It had a, a higher power to weight ratio. Uh, 
overall it was faster, but um, the, uh, the TP-51 was incredibly fast. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that not very long ago I was talking to Toronto Centre uh, on descent into Muskoka and they mentioned to Air Bravo that if they looked out their left window they were being overtaken by a P-51 Mustang. Nice. <laughs> so uh, that gives you a bit of an idea. Uh, uh, but it, one of the most delightful uh, airplanes to handle. It was, it was perfectly balanced um, and remarkably easy to land, which always surprised people. But the P-51 Mustang is in itself a fairly easy airplane to land. You just, you put flaps to full, hold it tail low and you'll touch and that's all there is to it. Hmm. So what was your, what was your top speed in this, in this plane? Um, I have done 340 miles an hour. Um, wow. Of course, you're buying more gas to do that too. Sure. So, did it enough. burn? Did it burn MoGas or I just have gas? It, theoretically, it could burn MoGas, but what we discovered uh, was the fact that the uh, in the fuel tanks, the fuel tank uh, ports, the suction ports, were suspended above, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the bottom of the tank. And we just found that that difference made a big difference in the reliability of the uh, starting and the fuel flow and so on. So I always ran it on Avgas. Um, and I would, I would use uh, TCP, uh, which, is a, um, which is basically a tetraethyl lead uh, binder, chemical binder. Uh, to help reduce plug fouling. And I also ran uh, fine wire iridium spark plugs. And obviously the RPM generated by that engine, the, the uh, was Cor Corvette? Corvette. Corvette, Corvette. engine yep. is a much higher RPM than is normally used in aviation. So, That's correct. So there's a gear reducer, there's a... Yes, it's known as a PSRU, a prop speed reduction unit. Um, my Mustang had a Cam Drive 500, uh, which is a Canadian uh, designed and built uh, gearbox. Uh, the quality of the workmanship was uh, amazing. Uh, it's all CNC uh, machined and polished and ground. Uh, it was a work of art. Uh, they're not cheap, but um, typically in, in automotive installations in aircraft, it tends to be the PSRU that fails. And I had had a previous failure I remember. On, on the original uh, uh, PSRU that although it looked similar, was an entirely different construction. Yeah, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit as well. So forgive me if I'm wrong, but this appears, Europe, you've always described yourself as a belt and suspenders type of guy. Yep. This particular airplane seems like it's a little out of your, not your, not your typical choice for a guy like you. I mean, obviously it's the third airplane in your airplane quiver yep. at the time. So maybe this is your, would be described as your sports car? Uh, yes, this is my your sort midlife of, crisis. My midlife <laughs> crisis. Well, actually it was really more a duty. Um, my, my good friend, Tony Hamblin, uh, who was very active uh, in aviation, always wanted a Mustang. And he had flown Crazy Horse and he'd flown a number of P-51s uh, in Florida and elsewhere, Arizona, uh, always wanted one. And everybody who owned a Mustang said, you don't really want one of these because they are a fire-breathing dragon and what they burn mostly is money. No kidding. Um, You're talking real Mustangs. Now. Real Mustang. Yeah. Uh, built by North American, you know, for World War II and post-World War Merlin II engines. service. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the ratio of flying to shop time was judged to be between one hour of flying equals eight to 12 hours of maintenance. So wow. at, you, big money, huge bucks. Huge Mess your bucks. Tom Cruise and, and, you know, making the Hollywood money. And exactly. And, <clears throat> and you're also not that concerned about flying it. 
Mm. Uh, and that's what, what turned Tony uh, away from the full-size Mustang. He could have bought one if he'd chosen. Um, but the reliability and the fact that when he wanted to go flying, um, he wanted to go flying. And so he, he chose an option that would give him better dispatch reliability is kind of what it boiled down to. And at the end of the day, if you're getting a similar performance, a similar rush, a similar flight feel, it seems like a sensible choice. Exactly. Well, and what ended up happening was that uh, Tony bought the kit. I started looking in about 1996 uh, by the records that I have, and he had a... Uh, he collaborated with uh, Auriga Design, which was in Halliburton, Ontario, and uh, Lake Central uh, Air Services, which is in Muskoka, not far away, um, to, to build this thing. He, he was in the finance business and the aircraft business. He was not going to be able to spend the time to build this thing. It would take 50 years. And he was also a perfectionist. And so he wanted this airplane to be as perfect as it could possibly be. So uh, Auriga Design uh, received the, the composite parts of the kit and assembled it uh, in their typical style, which is you know very high quality production. Um, and then it was moved to Lake Central where the components were assembled and then the airplane was built up. It was a very complex build. Uh, it's an electromechanical hydraulic system, uh, very, very difficult to rig, but once you've got it, you know, it's, it's a done deal. Um, so this is a kit built plane. It's obviously not a certified aircraft. It'd be classified as experimental. Experimental in Canada. Built. Um, I don't know a lot about that world cause I don't live in that world. I'm a member of EAA, but that's about as far as it goes. Yep. Um, you're, so you're allowed to offload uh, the building to somebody else. Is that correct? Well, like you can have someone else build it, or are you no. supposed, to, you're supposed to build 49, You're supposed to build 51% of it. 51 percent. Of it. Um, with a, with a, you can argue the merits of that, uh, of that rule all day long. The reality is if you want the best, most reliable and safest airplane um, and you can afford to do it, why not pay someone who is a professional or a company who are professionals to do this. Um, and uh, there was no lack of money spent on this airplane. Um, and ultimately, um, the, the airplane had a bit of a checkered history before I bought it, uh, coming from the paint shop. An apprentice inadvertently selected the gear lever up. So with a fresh Oops. coat of paint, it hit the deck, smashed the prop. Mm. It was a mess. That took a while to fix. Before and it even flew. Before it even flew. Crashed before it even flew. Yeah, yeah, it was a tough start. Um, and uh, then what happened after that uh, was that uh, Tony himself was doing some, uh, some ground runs, high-speed uh, ground runs, and this thing accelerates like a rocket. Like it, I've noticed when, when you push that throttle forward, there's going to be a lot happening really quickly. And then you've got to stop it if you're doing high speed runs. He was doing runs to test like his initial flight testing for the certification. Exactly. Process. He was, he was, he was, and also preparing himself to fly the airplane right. ultimately. Because it's a single seater. Train, you cannot train like you you cannot hire an instructor to sit in the back nope. seat and be holding the stick while you learn to fly. You've got to exactly. learn. Exactly. So yeah, how does that work? I mean, well, I mean, the the <clears> big <throat> thing with most tail draggers, and especially most high performance tail draggers, is is knowing that balance of when to put the power in, the speed with which you put the power in. And you'll notice I'm using the P51 because it's got a it's got a horizontal uh, throttle, um, and you push the nose forward. It's got a gigantic four blade propeller. You can't go too far forward or it's, it's gonna, gonna over. end up in matchsticks. Right. Um, and there is a, there's a certain sweet spot that you have to find where the airplane will literally jump forward uh, and the propeller gains its maximum efficiency, the wing gains its maximum efficiency. I mean, the, 
the takeoff run on this airplane at full power was about 800 feet, hmm. um, loaded to gross weight. Um, which is a person. <laughs> yeah, which is a person <laughs> about my size. Uh, so, um, and 42 gallons of fuel. Right. But uh, the reality is that in order to train yourself, you, you, you have to be able to stop the airplane. You know, power up, check your gauges, engines 4,500 RPM, acceleration normal, stick forward, tails up, ease it back, find the sweet spot. You can watch the airspeed indicator climb. And what's impressive is the rate at which it climbs. And then it's time to bring the power back and set the tail down and come to a stop. And he did that a number of times in a row. And unfortunately, he burnt through uh, brakes. the brakes. Oof. And as a result, a brake failed and he ground looped the airplane. Mm. At speed. That's, that's B. Mm -hmm. second, uh, second strike. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. And then the third strike was uh, uh, Tony decided to sell the airplane. And uh, because I'm an aircraft broker, he asked me, you know, could you find a home for my airplane? Um, this, is, this is about stewardship. This is not just about selling the airplane. It's a very it's about, special, special. Well, you treat all the airplanes. I mean, when I purchased my airplane, you were telling me I was, I was now the steward of the yes. Reams 1977 F337G Skymaster. It was mine for a time only, yep. most likely. And I am the, the steward of this mechanical wonder. Exactly. And it's up to me to take the best care of it possible and carpet. eventually hand it off to somebody else. Exactly. And that's, that's a great attitude for aircraft ownership, I you think. Know, and, and Tony, was, was he had spent a lot of money on this airplane. Um, and uh, so funny enough, he asked, uh, uh, he asked me to, to see if I could sell the airplane. And I said, well, you know, there are not many people uh, who will qualify for insurance. And he said, okay, well, why don't you see how big the universe is? So I called around the insurance industry, the people that I know, and uh, in a few days they got back to me and they said, five. There are five people in Canada that we would consider insuring. Oh, so they went through their whole, all their books, everybody who's already insured. And they, and they also looked at people. the actuarial tables. I don't tables. think I was on that list. I don't recall seeing your name, uh, but uh, the, the reality is I was one of the five. Oh. And uh, so he said, OK, you, you, you have to buy this airplane from me. And uh, so anyway, we so you had we, no choice in the matter. Yeah, I didn't have a choice. Uh, so uh, ultimately, I did buy the airplane from him uh, on the understanding that this was a stewardship deal. Um, this was an airplane that was going to tell the tale of the, the tremendously important role that the P-51 uh, provided, not just during World War II. That, everybody knows about that, but from a Canadian perspective, it was also well into the jet age that Canada had North American P-51 Mustangs as frontline fighters. And one of the reasons for that uh, was the fact that the early jets had this nasty habit of either catching fire or flaming out. Mm. And so the, the guys who had flown during World War II who were still uh, RCAF, um, they weren't actually many of them that fussy on flying, you know, the de Havilland vampire jet and so on because they didn't have a very good safety record. And they were already trained on the P-51. And they all, they, yeah, it was like putting on an old sure. pair of slippers. And it makes sense to keep your old fleet while you're sort of introducing the new fleet to keep redundancy in the, you know, spread, exactly. spread the risk out over a number of different airframes. Different, well, everything has different strengths and weaknesses. And from, a, from an operational perspective, you also have to remember the early jets were not very efficient. Mm. So unless you could engage a target within about 30 minutes of your operating base, you're going to have to land out. Mm. Uh, whereas the P-51, especially with the drop tank, um, you know, you could, you could fly a good uh, two, two and a half hours 
before okay. you had to worry about where you were going to land. So is this why the aircraft was painted the way it was? Exactly. So it was actually painted in, in Cold War RCAF colors. Mm -hmm. uh, very to, distinctive. Very distinctive, and it signified the importance of the P-51 well into the jet age of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Did you have any issue with the way the aircraft was painted, with the way the call sign was painted on the plane? Because it's a little, it's not, uh, what would you call it, normal, like the... No, it takes a special dispensation from Transport right. Canada. Okay. Uh, there's very clear standards about how large uh, registration letters should be and where they should be placed and mm -hmm. so on. Um, and as you'll recall, uh, the Mustang had very small letters a little behind. up under the tail. I saw that. Um, so that was the official letter. That was the official call sign lettering was under the tail, and then the. That's right. Okay. Yes, and that's so it had the the rondelle, yeah. and and it had its call letters, uh, Alpha Fox Hotel. Yeah, which um, wouldn't be legal without the exactly. secondary. Okay, exactly. that's what I thought. As yeah. I was looking at the photos again the other day, and I'm like, how does this, how does that work? Yeah. And what about the bottom of the wings? I don't remember what was on the there bottom. There was nothing under the wings. But you're supposed to have. Oh, yes, and that's part of the special dispensation. dispensation. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it didn't matter where you went with the Mustang. Um, every ground stop was at least an hour because people would come out. And this, this goes with the territory. If you're going to be the steward of a, a, an airplane like this, you have to be prepared to spend the time to talk to the people. Um, so any place I went for gas, always good for an hour. Uh, often an invitation to come back for an air show or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and that fulfilled the important role that, that Tony saw, and that fulfilled the role that I, as the steward of the airplane, saw. Right. So it was your Sunday driver? Yes. It wasn't yeah. your A to B, it wasn't your let's get some Actually, gear. I did use it, and I was using it for, for commuting. <laughs> Uh, because it's it's just a complete delight to fly, sure. uh, super quick, yeah. and um, uh, again, it it the sound of that airplane going overhead makes people look up, and there's that familiar line. That's look at that profile. Mm -hmm. So you'd literally have to watch for the like staying below 250 knots, below was it below 10? Yeah, 000? that's why I so I, to... I operated pretty low on the power band. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, so amazing aircraft. You got the, you had the opportunity to own this plane for for a time. Yep. You flew it a bunch. Seven years. Seven yep. years. And then uh, you had an, an initial incident with the aircraft that you mentioned briefly. So what was yes. what happened there? So so this is uh, item C on the incident list. Uh, so uh, after after I took uh, ownership of the uh, the airplane and 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 wanted to fulfill my role of stewardship flying it. The airplane had sat in the hangar for a number of years at Lake Central. Um, and of course, when I saw it, uh, that's what started me down this whole rabbit hole. And uh, so ultimately what happened was uh, Lake Central did a great job of returning the airplane to service. Uh, and I had to go through the 25 hour reliability testing phase, uh, which I did. Um, and as you know, I'm a big chicken. Uh, I never go far from the airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank the Lord that I didn't, because at 5,500 feet uh, on the 21st of August in 2017, um, the Garlock seal walked out of the prop speed reduction unit, the, the PSRU. Gear the gear reducer that we talked about. Exactly, it's the speed reducer. And the high pressure oil uh, blew out onto the hot exhaust logs and caught fire. Uh, I also had quite a bit of oil on the windscreen. Uh, so I made aid and uh, fortunately I was right above the airport. And uh, with a burning airplane, and we'll talk more about this later, but it, with a burning airplane, the objective is get it on the ground now. Mm -hmm. Do not delay. And so therefore, um, I elected to land gear up, flaps up, uh, on runway 36 in Muskoka. And I did that, came to a stop, uh, hopped out, and fortunately the, uh, the fire 
was out. And uh, thanks to the great good work of our crew at uh, Lake Central, uh, it, was a, it was a Saturday, and uh, they all came in, and 45 minutes after I slid to a stop on runway 36, the airplane was up and back in our hangar. So it, obviously the prop wasn't spinning that time because the PSU, PSRU was, had failed. The, the prop was, may have windmilled a tiny bit, okay. but uh, that, would, that would have been a So you broke a blade or two? Uh, yeah, the propeller was destroyed. Okay, propeller yeah. was destroyed. But the engine probably was not. The, the engine was destroyed as well. Oh, okay. Because the, in, in the first iteration of uh, that installation, uh, the engine oil was shared with the PSRU. Mm, okay. uh, I was never particularly fond of that setup. Uh, I didn't, I, th I could see the, the potential for failure there. Um, and Multiple failures. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what ended up happening when the PSRU Garlock seal blew out and the oil blew out, it was out of both the PSRU and the engine. Okay. So the engine was completely full of filings. Okay. So the plane was rebuilt. Yep. We put it back in service. Yep. And you continued to fly for... And, and uh, I have to say, uh, I, I re-engineered the oil system. I put in a bunch of other new stuff, uh, SDS electronic ignition, which is a godsend. Um, I put in a uh, Soldana racing tank and, and uh, its own oil supply to the PSRU. We ran uh, uh, Dexron uh, manual transmission uh, fluid, which was an excellent recommendation. Um, and that airplane was running so perfectly for, for so long. It just, we had all the bugs out of it. So you didn't just bring the airplane back to service. You didn't just repair everything. You made it better. Made it way better. I, I, I believe we, uh, it was a collaboration between uh, the uh, folks at Lake Central, uh, tremendous support in the engineering, the aerospace engineering uh, community, um, and also with suppliers. Uh, they, they were very forthcoming with information and knowledge and so on. Nobody tried to push their product. It's just, will this work for you? And, and it was working great. Okay. okay, so that was number three. Um, with the airplane, and then you, you've had it, you've flown it a bunch since then, you've had a great time, been on lots of Sunday drives. And then uh, two weeks ago, what was the date? Uh, March 4th, Monday, March, March 4th, beautiful Monday, VFR day. Monday, March the 4th, beautiful VFR day, you decided to, you were just going for a, going for a rip? No, I had a, I had a Lake Buccaneer in my hangar uh, that had, uh, in Collingwood, that had an avionics issue, and the, uh, uh, part of the avionics had to go back to Garmin. So I flew it over uh, to Lake Central where they would remove that module and send it away. And uh, I thought, what a peachy day to take the Mustang home. Mm -hmm. And of course, Evan and the crew at Lake Central had her out in the sunshine. She was all warm. It was 14 degrees, which for March the 4th is pretty astounding. Um, and it felt like a tremendous day to fly. Okay, so you took off, and you were heading to you were heading to Collingwood. Well, right? what what ended up happening was that um, one of the uh, one of the guys had asked if I could do a high speed pass, mm -hmm. and so it's part I of did, the stewardship thing, you got to do it. Well, it's <laughs> I, it it does shake things up around the old airport, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I did a high speed pass. And then I went around to another one. This was at Lake, at Muskoka. At Muskoka. Mm -hmm. uh, airplane was working perfectly. Gauges were all where they should be. Um, and then I, I, I'm a belt and suspenders guy. Uh, I could have cut straight across from Muskoka to uh, Collingwood, but I never do that uh, because it's rocks, trees, and water. Uh, so I typically fly down the west side of Highway 11, fly south toward Orillia, and there's a certain point at which I can look straight down Horseshoe Valley Road, which is as straight as a die, and 
I, I turn and I fly the north side of that road. And that's what I was doing. And I was, uh, it was kind of the, a little bit of a, a longer way home, but in my view, always the safer way home. Sure. Okay, so you're cruising along, and what was the first little thing that happened? The first little tremor? First thing uh, there, you there was no tremor. No tremor. Uh, <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was at 4,500 feet. I was doing uh, a very relaxed 160 miles an hour. I was in no rush to get home. Uh, it was a beautiful day. I was ahead of schedule. Uh, there was no reason to suspect that anything would happen. Um, and all of a sudden I thought, is that smoke I'm seeing or is that mist or what is it that I'm seeing in the cockpit? And um, I'm immediately, as you well know, my mantra is, if the engine fails now, where are you going to land? Mm -hmm. And so my route planning was important because I knew I had agricultural fields to land in. There wasn't an airport nearby, but you know what? Uh, a field's looking pretty good. And these are big fields. So uh, very quickly, I realized this was indeed smoke. And uh, I, I held the electrical, course. Electrical? Like electrical or oil? No, it had, a, it had a peculiar smell to it. I would know it if I smelled it again, which I hope never happens. Uh, but at that point, it was not an electrical smell. It smelled kind of between uh, oil and um, maybe radiator fluid that was too hot. Okay, yeah. And uh, so I and realized- the, the Mustang's liquid cooled. It, it is liquid cooled, yeah. yeah. It's an automotive engine, yeah. uh, it's a small block V8. And um, so I, I thought, well, okay, uh, Edenvale Aerodrome is not that far away. Uh, I will make it as far as Edenvale and see if this is a transient thing or if this gets worse, at which point I will land at Edenvale. Edenvale is not that far from Collingwood. And sorry, how, what was your altitude? I was at 4,500 feet, okay. 160 miles an hour. Heading was 244. Um, <laughs> He's got a uh, mind like a steel <laughs> trap, this guy. <laughs> With a rusty Do you spring. remember every <laughs> moment of time in your life? Uh, not quite, but a lot. <laughs> Photographic memory. Yeah. yeah, so question, I mean, why, why do you always refer to the speed in the TP-51 in miles per hour as opposed to knots? Well, because one of the things that happened during wartime production was they wanted to generate airplanes with big numbers. Uh, and so they listed the speed in miles per hour, which mm. was understandable to the common person who was helping to fund the war. Um, and it made them feel uh, like they had the edge. Now the Mustang did have the edge. Um, and <laughs> like the real P-51, the TP-51, airspeed was in miles per hour. Nice. Okay, so you're cruising along 4,500 feet? 4,500 feet, 160 miles an hour. Uh, I'm on the north side of uh, Horseshoe Valley Road between Craighurst and... Uh, Edenvale, and um, the smoke now starts to roll. Mm. Never, and a good, never a good sign. It's, it's, it's unless you're barbecuing. Yeah unless, yeah, unless you're barbecuing. And so what ended up happening was from the time I first detected the smoke and developed my plan, which was a few seconds, to the smoke becoming progressively more intense, that was maybe 15 or 20 seconds. Okay. Uh, so I could see this was not going to end well. Uh, it might not even end where I had intended. So as we know from the accident investigation into Swiss Air 111, uh, which crashed in the Atlantic Ocean off of uh, uh, Canada's east coast, if the airplane's on fire, get it on the ground mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and so that's what I did. I started down partly to see if I could make the smoke flow in the cockpit go over my head. Um, and that was not the case. It did not do that. It just continued to build. And 
so I was descending at uh, 450 to 500 uh, feet a minute. And I realized at that point that I could see flame uh, out the exhaust on both sides. There was a flame probably eight inches or so on each side, particularly on the left side. And um, I could see that the cowling was, was bubbling, the paint was Ooh. bubbling. Uh, and at that point, the smell and the texture of the smoke changed. Uh, and it got to be that electrical smell that you had asked mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, and I was watching the, the uh, I had both a Lambda gauge and also uh, an EDM. Uh, so I could watch my cylinders and I could see the cylinder head temperatures going up, which was very unusual. Uh, that, that engine always ran very cool. It's liquid cold, uh, I mean. It was being liquid cooled, and it, it follows the the race car mantra: hot oil, cold water. Okay. And and it it always ran like that. Only now I was getting hot cylinders, and uh, my lambda gauge was perfect. I had two green lights. I knew the mixture was was right, um, and uh, I couldn't pull really less power, uh, but I just kept going down and the smoke became so thick that I actually could not see the instruments. It didn't matter whether I moved forward or backward, I could not see the instruments. So you couldn't see outside? I, I could see outside by leaning over and looking down. Uh, and that was it. Uh, so, so at this point, have you, call, have, have you called in a mayday? Have you? I did. I called, uh, I called a mayday on the most local uh, frequency 12285, which is shared by both uh, uh, Huronia Midland Airport and my home base of Collingwood. And uh, by great good fortune, the uh, airport manager from Midland was right by the radio and he called me back. Uh, and I told him what I was going to do. And he immediately got in touch with another air airplane on the frequency to fly to my location. Now, I have to say, if that airplane ever showed up, I never saw it. <laughs> um, but So you didn't switch to center, you didn't switch to 121.5? No, no, always talk on the frequency, send your mayday on the frequency you last talked on and which you can most expect to get a reply. Don't take the time to switch to 121.5 or anything. Talk to somebody who's going to help you. Especially when all hell's breaking loose. You're on fire, you're descending, you exactly. can't see. You can't see. <clears throat> and one of the things, uh, and you and I had spoken about this earlier today, is the fact that with the radios today, uh, with their, whether it's a Garmin or whatever the case may be, um, they aren't like the old KX-155 LCD mm. uh, radios where they have a glowing instrument. Quite the opposite. The numbers are shadowed. So if there's any obscuring media in the cockpit, you cannot see those numbers. I so the last thing you want to do is start fumbling around with frequencies, get off frequency, get not off be able frequency. to get on another frequency. Now you're talking to talking nobody. Talking to nothing. Yeah. So uh, as the smoke was coming, <clears throat> I realized, um, and I said this on the radio, um, that I had my plan was to go to Edenvale. And then I went back on and I literally said, um, not going to Edenvale. I, I spoke too soon. I'm not going to make it to Edenvale. I'm going to land in a field on the south side of Highway 26. So you gave them co approximate coordinates. Yes. Yep. Uh, so so they, they knew where to dispatch uh, assistance. And um, I knew, because I've driven by this field for 60 years, uh, that it was a huge open field. But there was a row of mature spruce trees on the east side of it that I had to pass over. I couldn't see ahead, um, but I would know when I passed over the spruce trees. So I basically couldn't see the airspeed. I just flew by feel. Thank goodness I'd flown the airplane a fair bit. So you know there's spruce trees in front of you, but you can't see them. Yep, you can't see them. And uh, by the grace of God, I passed over the spruce trees. <laughs> and then all I could, all I could do was count on holding the airspeed 
and the fact that it was a really big field. Mm -hmm. And I, I Were you just into held the wind? wings level. I just held it <laughs> as wings level as I could. And I touched down. I gear up. Gear up, flaps up, because flaps I up. could not take a chance if the gear didn't lock for one thing because of the fire. Or if the gear was down and locked and the field was soft, you know, it's a muddy, I would have... Springtime, it's a muddy field. Springtime, I would have flipped over and now the burning engine is below the fuel source. Mm. It would have been over pretty quick. Where is the fuel in that? In okay. the wings. In the wings. Yeah. So um, I just held on, wings level, touched down. I slid 78 yards in a winter wheat field, uh, came to a 5.2 G stop. And I cast my harness, grabbed my little two-pound fire bottle, and jumped over the side um, and gave it a shot from both sides under the cowling. And that pretty well put the fire out. Um, but, I mean, the reason I had to end up in that field was the fact that um, my spark plug wires all burned off. Hmm. So I had, no, I had no power. So it wasn't making power at that point. It wasn't making power. And that plane doesn't glide very well, I'd imagine. No, it doesn't. It no, it's, like it's, it's uh, you know, it's about 19.7 pounds per square foot. So quite a bit heavier than a 172, you know. <clears throat> but it's a good glider. It, it, it glides well. So how, <clears throat> how did that landing compare to our, our forced landing in the, uh, in the Lake Buccaneer? Imagine this was a little more uh, extreme. Oh uh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, if anything, if you look in the Lake Buccaneer um, uh, video, we, we were bouncing. We were bouncing we a lot. Bounce, bounce, bounce. This was not. This was a plant. Uh, once that airplane was down, it stayed down. Uh, it's got a very heavy engine up front. That helps. Um, it smashed off all the propeller blades. I could, uh, you know. I didn't see it because of the <clears throat> smoke, but I could imagine those going off. So the prop was still spinning. Yeah, windmilling. That must be fairly dramatic, seeing the, or not seeing the prop blades. Fly yeah, I, I didn't want to see another prop go, but um, it's one of those things. You didn't ever consider shutting the engine off. I mean, you, you can't see, you don't want to stall anyone. it in at that point. I mean, I just can't even imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just, um, you just do what you have to do, and, and um, you know, people say, well, you must have been scared. No, <clears throat> you don't have time to be scared. And yeah. don't waste your energy on scared. Um, just fly the airplane as far as you can. That's, that's your job. Fly, fly it as it far into the crash site as, as you can. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you did that and you hopped out. So um, you know the G, you know the G rating of the landing from the engine monitor, I assume? Is it? No, because I have a G meter. You, so, you have a G meter on you. Yeah, well, there was a G meter in the panel. Oh, okay, okay. So 5.2 G is That's a pretty, considerable. pretty brisk stop. You would have felt that on your harness. Well, um, it, it came to, I mean, I was pushing mud. I was pushing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, topsoil. Um, and uh, so it came to a brisk enough stop. Did it nose uh, up? Th no, it didn't. No, oh. not at all. Not at all. Uh, it... Um, uh, my or my down, headset blew off, my glasses blew off, and somehow one of my hearing aids went with the headset. Oh wow! And uh, uh, that was that was poised to be the biggest concern. Um, but once the fire was out, I scrambled. It was still smoking, and you'll see the, the pictures. Um, I, I scrambled to get the stuff out of the back storage compartment. Cause the I log had, books and the... I had the log books. I had my uh, softy wedge parachute. I had my helmet. Uh, I had, you know... Uh, Your uh, lunch. Uh, I had my lunch. <laughs> You've got to save the lunch. I don't go anywhere without lunch. <laughs> <laughs> big, big lunch. <laughs> epic, <laughs> epic lunch guy lunch. right here. Uh, and... Um, uh, I grabbed all that stuff out. I put it. So you up, weren't hurt at all. Upwind, not hurt not, a bit. Not bruised, not no, hurt, not no. broken. And uh, wow. next thing, there was there was uh, a woman 
and a guy walk across the field, and they're really keeping their distance. Um, well, they and, think the plane's going to blow up. Or yeah, they watch or... a lot of TV. Yeah. Uh, and um, it didn't, of course. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's... Uh, You're sitting there having your lunch. Well, uh, yeah, I was having a chat with them, and, and uh, of course, um, uh, EMS arrived, the police and fire and ambulance and everybody eventually all showed up. How long up. did it take them to show up? Um, not that long. I would say um, I would say they might have been there in about... Uh, mm, fire was there probably in about four or five minutes. Oof, it was wow, pretty impressive. That's a pretty good response. They time. just came from the Stainer uh, Fire Department, so it wasn't far down the road. Okay. Um, and then... Um, uh, then the ambulance arrived. It was actually the last on the scene. The OPP were there. They were great. Just totally unflappable people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they know how the world works. Yeah. Wow, that's quite an experience. I mean, I can't even imagine. The smoke is the part that sort of terrifies me the most. I, I can't imagine flying my plane, not being able to see the panel, not being able to see out the front windshield, and being in an aircraft that's not making power. So you're only going one way. I just, yep. I would have a hard time imagining a situation like that. Obviously, it's something you dealt with, and you dealt with it successfully. You've probably dealt, well, you've dealt with it even with this plane a couple of times now, so you had some practice, I guess. Yes, the smoke was much, much <coughs> more intense this time than this the time first around. time. Okay. Um, it's, it's, was it hot? Like, were you starting to get hot? Oh, yes, it was very hot. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, so you're and worried about getting burned. Burned, death. yeah. Uh, my concern was I, I wasn't wearing my leather flying gloves mm. uh, because it was a warm day, for one thing. And I remember having this little discussion in my head. Can you give up one hand at a time to put your, uh, to put your leather flying gloves on? Because they're beside you. No, they're in my pockets. Okay. They're always in my pockets. Okay. And then I thought, if I can't see if the airplane's level how good will my left hand be to keep the airplane level while I get my right hand glove on? So you're not flying VFR, you're not flying by the horizon, you're not referencing instruments, you're neither. No, I can, I can look like this wow. and okay. I can see, and I, I just kind of, the wind uh, by great good fortune was coming out of the south-southwest. So I was gliding into wind, which was, you know, that 88 inch uh, MT propeller when it's not powered, it's a huge air brake. Mm. So my concern was the combination of the air brake of the propeller and the headwind was getting about. over those spruce trees. Right. I don't know how much I cleared them by, but I could see the cones on the, on the trees. So it was pretty <laughs> close. Wow. Amazing. So you walked away, you were standing there, everyone came, the airplane is there in a folded up in a little pile. Oh, it no, didn't it look did, too bad, actually. No, so the pro the props were broken off. Yeah. Obviously, it was covered in mud. Yep. Uh, most of the damage would have been on the belly, which on the belly. Isn't, vis yep. isn't visible. To me, it looked like a salvageable aircraft at that point. A lot of, a lot of spendy bits. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, it's carbon the, fiber wings. Was it damage to the wings? No, there's no damage to the wings. Uh, the, uh, of course, the lowest point of the airplane is the, the intake. Uh, air cooler scoop and the oil cooler scoop, right? Below mm. the airplane. Yeah, like Classic the Mustang look. Yeah. Um, and uh, then the nose cowl uh, was destroyed in the propeller. Yeah. So, you know, just from the law of large numbers, that's a $50,000 propeller. So, it's a wooden propeller. I was surprised to see that it was made out composite. of wood. Oh, it's composite. Okay, yeah. it looked like wood. It so looks like wood it, on the it is wood, but okay. it's a composite with uh, oh, so layers of wood at an angle inside the propeller, wrapped by carbon fiber oh, so with a nickel expensive. leading edge insert. <laughs> okay, so extra expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you called your your wife, your partner, and what did she have to say? Yeah. About well, it's funny because I was standing <clears throat> beside the OPP officer, and um, uh, I said, I, I, I got to call home. Yeah. And uh, so I called and uh, my uh, typically unflappable uh, partner uh, said, okay, so you're okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. I know you're busy. Um, and that was it. 
And the police officer looked at me and he said, that was it? And, well, she's had a lot of practice. And that's what I said. She's had lots of practice. So anyway, long and the short of it is um, we secured the airplane and uh, called the insurance company and so on and so forth. And transport, how was, was Transport Canada obviously was notified? Yes, they were. And in fact, that's something that uh, the uh, folks at home may want to know is that you can't, even if, if the airplane lands in an inopportune place. You can't move it. You can't move it. You have to have a transportation safety board release. Uh, and so uh, I called the TSB and uh, let them know what was going on. They asked me to send photos, which I did. They asked me to send a, uh, later that evening, uh, a description of what happened. And then the next morning, uh, they bounced back to me and uh, they allowed the release. Hmm. So we were able to So they didn't come and see it? They didn't know. No, uh, they, it's called a category five. Uh, it's basically information and data recovery only. And I mean, was there, an, is there any difference between say, if that was a certified aircraft that had crashed, gone down in that field and an experimental kit built airplane, <clears throat> do you think they would have? It's at their discretion. I mean, it would depend upon the, the cause. Um, we had a pretty good idea of what went wrong with the Mustang. Um, Generally speaking, aircraft fires are, they get a lot of attention because the potential for uh, this to be a fleet issue mm -hmm. um, is there. But this is a one-off airplane. This is the fleet, it's a fleet of one. Yeah, so they, they classed it as a category five. Okay. So what was the, what was the cause? What did you guys discover? Well, uh, it was interesting when we dismantled the cowling and pulled it all off to have a look inside, uh, we found a hole melted through the left bank of this engine, through the cylinder head, through the rocker box. And that hole was, I could put my hand down through. And so this led to the conclusion that it was an exhaust valve that had either stuck or broken off, and that allowed the exhaust port to act like a blowtorch. And it basically went up, <clears throat> it melted a three inch thick aluminum head, it burned through the rocker box, and of course right above that is the wiring. So hence the difference in the Smells. type of smoke and the smell of the smoke mm. as the fire progressed. But you didn't notice a different, you didn't notice a power, a power change issue. I, I began to notice on the EDM that I was losing cylinders. Mm. And I didn't know whether I was losing cylinders because the wires were burning off or because uh, the cylinders were actually going out of service. And in fact, both things were happening simultaneously. Do you think because you were running at a lower power setting, it was maybe less noticeable from a mechanical perspective? And you uh, noticed the fire first before the mechanical? Well, I, th I think um, when, I, when I landed, I was pretty sure, because the last thing I was smelling was electrical. So I was pretty sure this had to be electrical in nature. I was not looking for a mechanical failure per se. Um, but, you know, these small block Chev engines are known for continuing to run with the most horrific damage. Um, and this one clearly did. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it was the cause of the <coughs> failure on one side of the equation, but, uh, the fact that it got me safely to the scene of the crash, um, was... And over the trees. And over the trees, yes. Forget hitting, that. hitting 40 foot spruce trees well up at minimum airspeed, uh, that's going to turn into a bad scene. What's your, what's your maximum, what's your glide, maximum glide speed um, or your glide speed on that plane? Typically you glide about 100 miles per hour. Okay. Um, I have no idea what my speed was. You couldn't see? I couldn't see. Hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable, Paul. I mean, this it was almost a year, just over a year after the, the incident with the Buccaneer. I mean, it's, it seems... I guess from an outsider's perspective, it would almost seem like you've 
been in a lot of plane crashes, which you have. Which I have. Um, but that's my profession. It's your profession, and how many hours do you fly a year? How many hours did you fly last year? Well, um, just recently, and I, I know this because I had to look it up for insurance, um, in uh, 2022, I flew 850 hours uh, on about 160 types of airplanes. Uh, and so you've in, flown as many hours in one year as I've flown in my entire career of almost 10 yeah, years. I, I, I mean, I fly not every day, but I fly most days. Uh, last year, uh, I, I took it a little easier. I had a lot of work to do around the farm and stuff. Uh, and I only flew 550 hours. Hmm. So, uh, and, and that was on uh, 121 types. So, so a, lot of air, a lot of different airplanes, a lot of different types, a lot of airplanes that you, I mean, this one you obviously was your plane. You know the history yeah. of it, you know everything. But a lot of times you're flying planes like the one that we were in, for instance. We didn't know the history. We were just flying no. some, we were ferrying a plane across Canada. And, and, and that's, that's it's the nature of the beast. I yeah. mean, uh, very often I try and do as much homework as I can. Uh, I talk to as many people as I can about an airplane before I arrive to uh, inspect it and then ferry it. I do a highly detailed inspection on it. Very often that's where it ends. Mm. Um, I will give the owner or the uh, AME uh, a list of snags that need to be repaired. Uh, some of them decide to get somebody else to fly the airplane. Um, that's fine. Uh, that has actually led to fatalities in the past. So you've, uh, you've said, I won't fly that plane, and someone's flown it and yeah. done poorly? Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> and, but most owners want to have a good airplane, especially if it's an airplane they've just purchased. Mm -hmm. um, so they do the work, and, uh, and then I set off. And, I mean, on an airplane I don't know, I will not fly at night. Uh, I will not fly in cloud. Uh, it has to be pretty decent VFR. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I remember that on our trip. You were very careful. We picked and chose our routing. Um, nighttime was was a no no. We flew we flew into the dusk. We flew into, into dusk. Calgary. That was, and that was pushing it. And you were it, it was touch and go whether we were going to land. Yes, you, it was. You know, an hour from Calgary, and we decided to push on. But yep. by then we'd been in the airplane for four days, so we had a pretty yes. good idea of yes. a good track record. And that was a different different plane than the one that. Failed a on much us more survivable airplane. Yeah, and we were over the prairies exactly. in the winter. Exactly. Yeah. So it really is. I mean, when we learned this, I remember doing my flight training, and I mean, they really drill into you all the all the drills and all the skills and everything you need to do in every emergency situation that everybody should be practicing all the time. And they were always. I remember my instructor saying, "It's it's not a matter of if, but when." And I mean, you've, you've definitely proven this and you've also shown how valuable it is to all of this stuff that you've told us. You know, your route, your route selection, the way you fly the plane, yeah. your understanding of the history of the airplane, your ev even so much as y the fact that you've driven this stretch of road and you, you were familiar with the field that you landed in. I mean, not ev everybody has that opportunity, but these are the things, this is pilotage 101. Yes. Or it's maybe airmanship. 301. Airmanship. Airmanship. Um, knowing as much as you can about every part of the system, yep. whether it's the environment, the, the, the farmer's field, the aircraft, the, the uh, everything. Every, everything you can get your hands on and never be afraid to ask a question, never be afraid to look like a bit of an idiot. Um, it's amazing when you talk to the local pilots, for example, at, a, at an airport, and you say, you know, I'm thinking of going from, from here to such and such. Well, you know, you should go this way because it's a little safer. There's a little airfield down there. Well, That's why would I not look at that? Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, put that in your back pocket. And the great thing is, you know, um, we were very, very fortunate I say we because the Mustang is a, it's a, uh, it's a team thing. Uh, my name might have been on the <clears> registration, <throat> but it was the Lake Central team that kept that flying. Mm -hmm. um, and we we're very fortunate in the fact that I landed in a field, a farm field, smooth flat farm field. The farmer, the fellow who owns the farm is a great guy. 
Um, his two hired men uh, were a huge help uh, to us. And the neighboring landowner comes from an aviation family. Hmm. Um, so it was, we had tremendous support. I found this everywhere I've been in aviation. It's one of the great, greatest things. So they helped it. you get the plane out of the field? Absolutely, yeah. So what was the, what happened next? I mean, the insurance company obviously was made aware of the situation. Yep. The, will the plane fly again? Um, it is my sincerest hope that it will fly again. Um, from an economic perspective, it's, it's to pay someone to make it fly uh, is going to be a very expensive uh, process. Um, if someone wished to take that on as a project and do it with free labor hours, it's going to be a heck of a lot of work, but I think a very worthwhile result. And I sincerely hope that someone will take up this challenge. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful airplane. And yeah, it'd be nice to see it fly yeah. again. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, another amazing story, Paul. I mean, it's, yeah, amazing. And it's, I'm so thankful that you were willing to tell the story. I mean, not everybody, uh, crashing an airplane is not something necessarily everybody, I mean, you're a flight instructor as well. It's not something everybody wants to talk about. I think it's absolutely valuable information. People need to talk about this stuff. They need to talk about aviation safety. They need to talk about incidents are one of the places you can learn the very most about aviation safety Absolutely. from real world situations. Yep. And then hearing your backstory about this has been so educational to me. I mean, you've done this throughout my flying career, taught me things that I would never normally think of when it comes to flying. And, and you've probably saved me, you know, 10 times already. And the, the fact that you're giving this information out to the community freely is Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you well, so much. Well, I've been very fortunate over my uh, career, which is now 47 years. Uh, I've had very good people in my life who set great examples, who held me to a very high standard, uh, who made me not afraid to ask questions, uh, even if I do look like an idiot sometimes. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's very important that we keep our ego in a very tiny plastic bag somewhere in our flight bag and not let it get in the way of learning everything we have to do. And we have to look after our fellow pilots. Absolutely. It goes with the territory. Yeah, and you'll never know everything. Nope. Won't Between me and you, we probably know everything. <laughs> but you know most of it. <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us to your home and for sharing your story. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, I look forward to flying with you again. Yes, hopefully wonder soon. I wonder what the next adventure will be. I'm sure we'll come up with something. Oh, I've got some things in the hopper. Let's, del <laughs> let's deliver another plane to the Northwest Territories. Another float yes, plane to the Northwest Territories. I was thinking that the other day. That would be a good idea. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Don't forget to like and subscribe the channel if you like seeing stuff like this. Paul and I will continue flying and hopefully not continue having aviation incidents. <laughs> But the more you fly, you never know. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, Paul. That was good. Thanks, Tom. What we have here is a fighter escort wing TP-51 Mustang. It was built in the year 2000. It is a very sporty uh, experimental category airplane. This TP-51 Mustang is a 66% scale model of the original P-51. A critical difference is it's a composite aircraft. It's not aluminum. As a result, it's very strong, it's very slick, and it's very fast. This airplane is finished in RCAF colors as it would have flown during the Cold War era. It's interesting that many Canadians don't realize that Canada and the RCAF actually had P-51 Mustangs. They often think of them as being strictly an American uh, aircraft. In the air, the airplane handles uh, exactly like you would expect a fighter to handle. It is designed to about plus nine G and negative six. It can be a very aerobatic airplane, lots of speed, 
a nicely balanced, good center of gravity. The performance of the engine is very, very strong. It's very sporty, tremendous amount of thrust. The airplane itself weighs 2,400 pounds and it has 378 horsepower. So it's about the weight of a Cessna 172 with uh, more than twice as much horsepower. And of course, it has six gun ports, but no 50 caliber Brownings. Uh, so you can pounce on your buddies uh, from altitude and uh, with a v &E at 380 miles an hour, you can zoom by them and uh, blow their hats off. It's an airplane that turns heads wherever it goes. People want to know about the airplane, and that's the purpose of it. We want people to know about the history of the P-51 and its service in the Royal Canadian Air Force. For those who are serious about owning a real replica World War II fighter, then there's nothing better than this TP-51 Mustang. If you would like to fly a fighter like this, Give me a call 